afternoon and welcome. I'm Lori Carbono, Executive Director of McLean Project for the Arts, and I feel like one of the most fortunate people in the world. It is a treat to have this role and on behalf of my colleagues and our board to thank you for being with us and helping to bring some joy to MPA Virtual Art Fest 2020. One of the highlights of MPA Virtual Art Fest 2020 is this Meet the Artist series. This week it's brought to you by BOA, the McLean-based design, build, and remodeling experts whose commitment to quality, excellence, and community service make a huge difference in our world as I know they do the rest of the community. Bo, we thank you for your support and we thank you for being a part of this MPA Art Fest Meet the Artist series. Today, you have a real treat in front of you. Jen Lillis, artist, artist educator, and member of the MPA team is having time one-on-one -on -one with Katie Shuta, Cheryl Edwards, and Sylvie Van Helden. It's a real treat, Jen, for you to spend time with these artists, and we thank you for allowing us, the audience, to understand more about their mediums, their motivations, and their work. I'd like to call your attention before we go to an event that you'll find more details on our mpaartfest.org website under the Events tab, and that is Sunday night at 8 o'clock. Come back to enjoy the MPA Art Plus Music Moonlight Concert Series. It's lovely to be together, and we thank you again for being here. Welcome to MPA Art Fest Artist Talks. My name is Jennifer Lillis, and I am the gallery manager at McLean Project for the Arts. I am also a practicing artist and one of the coordinators for the Art Festival. I am thrilled to welcome you and introduce you to three fantastic artists exhibiting in this year's MPA Art Fest. To those of you who are new to MPA Art Fest, this is now its 14th year and its first virtual festival. MPA Art Fest brings art and community together, offering events, music, artwork, and much more. This year, we are thrilled to be exhibiting 52 artists on our website. I encourage you, if you have not already, please head over to the studios in the artist section of the website and browse their works. You can find all the information at mpaartfest.org. I'm excited to introduce to you three artists that I will be interviewing tonight. The three artists are Katie Shudhi, Cheryl Edwards, and Sylvie Von Helden. So to start things off, I would like to introduce Katie. Katie, thank you so much for joining me tonight. How are you doing? I'm great. How are you? Thank you Good. for having me. Awesome. So um, just to kind of get things started, I would like for you to kind of introduce the audience to what you're working on and where you are right now. Um, well, I'm currently kind of a little all over the place. Um, I guess I would say my first love was jewelry making, um, which I've probably been a lifelong jewelry maker. Um, and continuing with my art practice, um, I've been a crocheter now for probably 20 years. And the crux of my work really, regardless if it's jewelry or um, in some cases I've gone also kind of back to 2D uh, stuff as well. Um, there's always a component of crochet. So whether it's uh, used to make the piece or if it's the inspiration for the work, uh, there's some element of that fiber technique within my work. Nice. It's kind of really nice to think a lot of things we're talking about are kind of really like hands on and the making the meticulous of process. And so um, maybe you can talk a little bit more about the actual making process and kind of what your approaches are to the jewelry and the crochet making. Um, so what I like to do is uh, utilize the process of crochet as a method for working with materials in kind of unrelated areas of art. So in the case of jewelry, uh, that can be crocheting wire to actually make jewelry pieces or uh, to make other metal components that I might embed in enamel, let's say, um, 
I've also used uh, actual fiber that I've crocheted to kind of make, instead of out of metal, um, the bezels, if you would, uh, if you will, for um, uh, enamel pieces that I've then, I've set in basically a fiber crocheted bezel and that becomes the uh, jewelry piece. So uh, for my 2D work, um, the crochet, I've often taken um, uh, currently existing pieces, so doilies that were actually made by other individuals. I actually don't really know the provenance of some of these doilies. A lot of what I use is um, vintage or antique doilies that I've um, gotten from, donated to me from family members, sometimes other classmates, um, some places I've picked up in uh, antique stores in Europe, uh, Prague in particular. And I use those as a way to build up layers in two-dimensional artwork. So I spray paint through them uh, in different colors. And then I often go back in, uh, depending on the work, and I will stitch into the paper that uh, I've sprayed these doilies on, and then I crochet up forms that way. So I've kind of, I've painted with paint, and then I've kind of painted and filled in and outlined with crochet as well, as opposed to inks or paints or pen. Nice. So it seems like you really are kind of dabbling in a lot of different mediums with your practice. And so, um, and also I'm really into, like, I'm really into how you're talking about like the vintage and this repurposing of these objects that you're finding in different like, like situations. And so um, I wonder if you can kind of maybe describe a little bit more your style in your practice. And so and maybe if you have any examples on hand of like what type of like visuals that you work with besides just the stenciling. Um, well, for some jewelry pieces, and um, I hope to have these up in my studio uh, on the website. Um, so this is an instance, let's see if the camera can get in there well. So the metal that's in the colored enamel spaces, that's crocheted wire that's uh, been embedded in the metal. So I crocheted some fine silver wire. And um, then the, basically what's created the actual neck necklace piece and is holding the enamel in place is more crocheted actual fiber. Um, and so all of it's crocheted, including the um, mechanism or the clasp. Oh, wow. Um, a big component, I would say, in addition to the crochet that kind of ties all, I guess would be an overarching theme of all my work is color use. Um, I very much enjoy color and utilizing it um, is, much as I can. Um, so let's see, kind of running in the same vein as that necklace, I have a uh, set of brooches. So again, embedded uh, crocheted wire into enamel that's fired. Uh, if people don't know, enamel in this case is vitreous enamel. It comes in a powdered form and uh, you apply it to a metal surface, most often, in my case, copper, but also silver or gold. It's placed into a kiln and fired, similar to the way ceramics are. And um, that fuses the glass and creates a solid surface. So um, these go through a firing process. And then, which is kind of interesting to kind of work on that end where you know, obviously fiber would not handle a kiln very well. So, <laughs> but then I've used fiber to create the bezel portion of this brooch. Nice. And so um, I got like, I actually am really curious of like, what's the experience of crocheting wire versus crocheting the fabric? Um, the actual process. There's definitely overlap and similarities. Uh, the first time I crocheted wire uh, back when I was an undergrad, it was in response to an assignment in a metals class I took. And when I finished that project, I said, never again, I'm not crocheting <laughs> wire. It was, uh, it was a little rough on your hands. You definitely need to pace yourself. And um, obviously it wasn't never again, or I guess I'm a glutton for punishment, but I continued doing that. So it's, um, Basically, especially if you're familiar with crochet, so uh, crochet, you use a hook to create loops of um, the fiber that you're working with to create a fabric, whereas knitting is most people are probably more familiar with where you have two needles. Um, so with wire, I just kind of go up generally a hook size um, if I can. Sometimes the what I'm working on, that's not feasible. I need it to be a tighter 
uh, fabric, if you will, even though it's metal. And, um, but that's basically it is, you kind of got to pace yourself and just realize that at some point in the day, you might need to stop. Whereas if I had been working with fiber, I could probably go all day long at this point if I needed to. So. Yeah. So how long does it take to actually complete one of those pieces? Um, I've never actually timed myself, but, uh, hours to days. I mean, I kind of work in, I get shifts maybe. Um, so like in the case of those enameled pieces, um, the wire, I kind of crochet in a step and then I prepare everything to get enameled. And then once everything's kind of enameled, then I'll move on to, um, what I want to do fiber wise or how it's going to be set basically. So it's, um, it's broken up probably over, um, at least a week, I would think if I really, um, put all my energy into one piece at a time, nice. at least, I... yeah, depending on size. So nice. And so, yeah, um, just to kind of talk a little bit more about the actual MPA art fest, what type of things can we expect to see on your site? Uh, definitely jewelry. Um, pretty much all jewelry. I have, uh, those enamel pieces. I've got, um, brooches similar to uh, what I just showed you in a couple of other different colors. So this was actually, um, these are kind of from a series that I'm calling Odds and Ends. And these are actually, um, the challenge I've kind of set for myself is to use things I've held on to from, uh, in particular, my academic career. And these were test samples. These started off as, um, a way to see if I could actually do this with the metal, if I could embed it into the um, enamel after I crocheted it and how that would work. So, and a lot of that, um, a lot of these pieces are kind of coming out of experimentation. I don't, I kind of have to figure everything out when I'm working with um, crochet and incorporating it into the jewelry because I don't know if things are gonna work. So um, in the case of these four brooches, uh, so in this instance, I used a opaque enamel. So you kind of get a much more um, clear transition between the wire and the enamel. And um, in this one, which was kind of its uh, sister brooch, I guess, I used a uh, similar color, but it's a transparent enamel. So you kind of get more of the depth of um, the crochet wire in there. However, uh, when you crochet with the wire too, it's still kind of thick. It's, pr it's still pretty much like um, if you crocheted a fiber piece. So what's nice with the metal too is after I've crocheted something, I can really go in and kind of bend it and manipulate it further in a way that I can't with something that's crocheted from traditional fibers. So these brooches, while similar, again, in an opaque enamel, I actually hammered the crochet piece uh, and the wire flat after I finished it. So again, I tried it in the opaque enamel. And in this brooch, again, uh, hammered the final crocheted component flat, but then embedded it in a transparent enamel. So the challenge I've kind of set for myself is to use all these pieces to see um, what I can make with them because obviously I've held on to them for a long time. I completed my master's in 2011. So in a way they're kind of, I value them on some level and it just seems like a shame that I hadn't done with it, anything with them until this point. So that's kind of where I think a lot of my jewelry pieces are currently going. Uh, and with this necklace, I have a second one too that I did in different colors, but, but um, the embedded wire pieces that are in there, that was uh, where I, I crocheted the wire, but I went back and kind of looked at all of these different stitches you can make with crochet. And a lot of them are very uh, traditional. They've been around for a long time. Like if you get books from the 1900s, you can find some of these stitches. So I played around with um, crocheting different samples out of the silver wire and then embedding it to see if, you know, there was a difference in the way the patterns reacted with the enamel and how they showed up once they were in the glass. So. Nice. And, um, um, some other pieces, again, uh, kind of going with um, the uh, crocheted bezel theme. 
Uh, I was very fortunate in grad school, I was able to take a fused glass class. And at the time, it was a really nice um, opportunity to just play and um, experience a way of making art that I really hadn't before. There was definitely similarities with things I've done in the past, but fused glass is a lot different than some things I had done. So I just started making all of these cabochons because I knew at some point jewelry, of course, right? I've got all this glass, I need to make it into something wearable. And again, they kind of sat for a while and occasionally they would just stare at me and go, and you need to do something with us. So eventually I um, put them together and just started uh, crocheting uh, these pieces of glass together into wearable necklaces. So I believe I will have three, uh, this one included of this style, hopefully on my, in my studio. Nice. Or I will, I will have, I have three of these included. You do. Currently in my studio. Yeah. But, um, yeah. And so, um, but really interesting, even kind of being able to see this through zoom is the way that you're actually handling the, like the function of embedding the stuff into the actual object. And, mm -hmm. um, the way that you're kind of revisiting past work and trying to kind of like revitalize it in a way that it can live on in a different function, right? Yes. And so um, I love that. And I can't wait to be able, I can't wait to like, go through your site. And so um, before we sign off, do you have anything else that you would like for the people who are going to visit your page to know about your work or where else they can find you? Uh, I do have a personal website. It's um, katieshuddy.com. So my first and last name together. Uh, you can visit uh, or you can check me out there. I have all of my work past and current viewable on that site. Um, if you have questions, please don't hesitate to reach out and ask me. Um, it's kind of hard to do the elevator pitch to some people and explain some of the art, especially when um, it's things like enameling and the metal smithing and stuff. It's not as mainstream as to say, oh, well, I use oil paints or I use acrylics. More people tend to know what you're talking about right off the bat when you mention that. So please, um, I love hearing from people if they have questions or comments about my work or um, anybody too who is a fiber aficionado and um, does their own kind of fun crochet. There's definitely a, kind of a movement back towards fun fiber stuff and like, almost like a rediscovery rediscovery of uh, fiber techniques that were kind of considered granny or kitsch. So if you do any of that too, I'd love to hear from you. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for participating in this year's Art Fest and good luck with everything. And thank you so thank much you. for joining us today. Yes, thank you so much for having me. Awesome. Thank you, Katie. Hi, everybody. And now I am with Cheryl Edwards. Hello, Cheryl. How are you tonight? I'm today? doing well. How are you? I'm good. You know, just living my best life. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I know that you the tables have turned a little bit here where the interviewer now becomes the interviewee. So um, now that you are being interviewed, I would like for you to introduce yourself and kind of talk a little bit about your practice. Okay, thank you. I'm Cheryl Edwards. I'm a DC local artist, and usually I create in mixed media painting and printmaking. So my practice consists of, you know, trying to do a similar thing in many processes. But that is just how the process goes, how it begins is with a, a concept and then I decide if I'm going to work in series, which I usually do, and then I um, deal with the pro process that I'm going to use um, in view of the, in view of the concept of the series. And I do all sorts of things. Um, I use ink and I use oils. I use acrylic and I do a lot of things in mixed media with photo transfer and stitching and attaching things. 
such as beehives or any other thing that I think, you know, speaks to the work that I'm creating at that moment. And that's just, you know, kind of like the process in which I work. For the past five years, I've been involved with examining the whole concept of water as a metaphor uh, for identity and memory and even for reverence. And so that has, t that has taken up much of the subject matter and the concept of my practice since 2014. Awesome. And so um, water is actually a really interesting element because it does have so many different functions, right? And it comes in so many different ways. And so um, and kind of thinking about this like flowing continuity and water being something that gives life and water is something that can also be very destructive. Right. It has so, um, dual qualities. Yeah. And so like even this kind of like, this like function of duality is really interesting. Kind of like, I wonder, is there a way that you kind of handle that in the way that you are approaching how you're choosing the process and making the work? I know you were kind of talking about starting with a concept and then allowing the kind of concept to work into the process and the practice and so on. I wonder if you have like any type of like insight to maybe like an example of something of how you're handling that. Well, in the beginning, with, not with the work that you see behind me or the work that I'm showing at the festival, there were just single panels of raw canvas on ink stain. And there were maybe 12 or 13 of them. There were 34 by 60. 50% of them I made with DC tap water. And the other 50% I went to the um, shrine at the Catholic University and got the blessed water and made it with them. Just to see what were there any distinctions or differences? Um, but I think that beyond just using the blessed water, the time that it was done was at the month of, no, the beginning of the um, administra current administration. And um, I think energy just transmits from everything in regard to that. But in terms of your question, I'm looking at water as a way, I would say, from the dark to the light. Uh, water has memory, so water has all and many of the historical elements that are before our time. And it will have all of the historical evidence of this pandemic after our time. Scientists in, in Germany, you know, they have come out and concluded that water does have memory based upon their experiments, which is a huge step from where science has been before on this issue. And I'm looking at it in terms of identity. How does those memories contained within water, contained within your DNA, manifests itself in your current, you know, your current identity and who you are and how you self-identify. I know it sounds complicated, but th that's, that's, what, that's what this is about. As opposed to using water as a deity, you know, to examine the whole aspects of that. So maybe I hope I answered your question. <laughs> I don't even remember my question. I'm joking. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, something that you did kind of touch upon a little bit is kind of thinking of, of your work in terms of like identity. And so is this something that you would say is like a theme in your practice? Like an, or something that you kind of reapproach in different ways? Well, I think artists are typically always thinking about identity. But and I think in this regard, I've been very specific about it, you know, um, very spe specific about it um, as it relates to race, as it relates to who you are, and basically, in this instance, I've used I, the whole concept of identity, identity to address that 
issue. Awesome. So um, what are you working on right now? Well, I, I'm still painting paddle dolls. Um, I'm making them in tribute to some of the COVID um, victims that I personally know because we've lost our artists. We lost David Driscoll. Uh, we lost Louis de Sarte from Atlanta. Lots and lots of people. And uh, I intend to make 10 30 by 40 canvases on oil and also make some prints concerning these paddle dolls because I've learned one thing that the pandemic has provided is brought some things to me. And I found an expert on paddle dolls academically. And that was like, I didn't even think that that existed, right? But that has just, you know, helped the whole um, creative process along, along knowing meanings of things and having questions answered that were not answered be or known before. Are you saying paddle dolls? Is that what you're saying? Paddle, P-A-D-D-L-E. They're Egyptian paddle dolls. They're the oldest doll in the world. Oh, okay. From 1040 to 2000 BC. Um, and they were buried in the tombs of the deceased in Egypt. They were known as soul retrievers and soul refreshers. And they were, um, they were following the, the um, cult of Hathor, who was the daughter of, of Ra. And they were dancers and musicians, and they played the flute, and they had these hands called the clappers that they used in their dance. And the whole concept was that, you know, Hathor's Ra was dead, Hathor danced in front of him nude, and he woke up, you know, and they've carried that on. They're like, if they can't revive the dead, then they'll go under underworld with them and refresh them in the underworld. So it has just really blown open how where I began on this path to what I have found out now. That's about all I can say about it right now. Yeah. I'm kind of like you're definitely kind of in this stage of still discovering and mm -hmm. just kind of like experimenting and investigating. And um, I'm also like really in, in, interested in how you're kind of having this like different forms of research coming into your practice. And so um, my other, like, my next question will be, what can art, what can people expect to see on your website for MPA Art Fest this year? Okay, you will, um, I believe you will see some paddle dolls and uh, you will see in a, a variety of work. I didn't put just one series on there. You will see um, a variety of work in different types of processes and media. And most of them will be medium to small pieces. And I think you might find them interesting it will probably give you a glimpse of my practice because, you know, prior to these paddle dolls, race has always been a uh, part of my practice very strongly. So I, I am excited that you're going to view my work and I, and I look forward to hearing your response. Thank you. And our third artist this evening is Sylvie Van Helden. Hello, Sylvie. How are you today? I am good, Jen. Thank you. Thanks awesome. I'm excited to be here. Great. Yeah, I'm so happy you're able to join us. And so um, to kind of get things started with this interview, I would like you to introduce yourself and kind of talk a little bit about your practice. Sure. Um, so um, as you know, my name is Sylvie, and um, I'm a Baltimore-based artist. And um, let's see, I... I have been in Baltimore for quite a while and I came here for grad school. So I went to um, art school at MICA um, in the 2000s. <laughs> and um, so my practice has actually grown, I would say in the last six or so 
five to six years. Um, I'm also a teacher, um, so that I do that during the day. And um, for a while that consumed a lot of my time, but um, I decided to go part-time a couple years ago and spend more time working on my art. So I have been able to, um, and I've been um, working on several bodies of work over the last couple years. Um, so I work in mixed media. I'm a painter by, um, by, by um, teaching and um, I do painting on um, panels and on paper. And I, I work in some collage elements. Um, so yeah. Nice. And so um, can you talk a little bit, do you have any like themes or topics that you work through in your practice? Yeah, sure. I know some artists, you may like look at their work and be able to identify a theme that is like, you know, current through all their work over the years. I wouldn't say I necessarily have like one theme. I say, I would say that I, I um, you know, move around a little bit based upon like, I think a lot of times it, it, it depends on what it's going on around me at the time. And so art is a way for me to kind of channel like and make sense of what's going on around me um so like in the early 2000s outside of when i got out of grad school i did a series of paintings that were a play on kind of the division between art and craft and um they i call them wallpaper paintings so they were very um very lively and very patterned um and i actually um intended for and had them I had each of the paintings have multiple like backgrounds, wallpaper backgrounds as accessories. So the, the paintings were one thing and they kind of stood on top of a wallpaper background. And I had different options. So the idea of kind of accessorizing the painting, so it was a little bit of a play on, on that idea. Like I didn't wholly believe in, in that idea of the division between fine arts and crafts. Um, so I had a theme going on with, um, you know, influences from design and, and crafts. And I'd say more recently, um, I've done a series of paintings that are called the hashtag mandalas. And I've been interested in spirituality and, and kind of how it's trans being transformed by our very quick, like our quick lives, like and how technology is making things faster and faster. and. Um, I kind of feel like we need to slow down a little bit. So, um, so I've taken the format of the mandala, but I've brought in images from Instagram, which is a social media, you know, social media site um, to kind of deal with um, ideas about spirituality. Like I, I take each of the works revolves around a term that has spiritual connotations and I'm sourcing other people's images to put in these mandalas. Oh, nice. And um, I mean, being a fellow Instagrammer who yeah. role, right? So um, even thinking about the function of mandala, like mandalas and kind of like going into these very meditative spaces and kind yeah. of now you can get lost going through a hashtag, right? And so you just kind of like start scrolling oh. down the screen. You just kind of get stuck into the Instagram world. It's kind of like all these random, like, I mean, depending on what type of hashtag you're looking at, right? Yeah, so, absolutely. There what type of hashtags are you looking at? Um, what what specific ones? It's anything. Yeah, yeah. So um, I use terms like um, purify and devote and obsess. Um, what else? I think crave. You know. So some of them were like. So I I I was like when I was younger. I was brought up as a Catholic. You know, and I was thinking a little bit about like the seven deadly sins and stuff. So some of them are, are things like that, that kind of evoke that seven deadly sins um, kind of thing. But um, those were some of the terms. And, and like you said, you can get lost because the responses that I got, like the images that came up from each of those searches, I mean, some um, results were like in the thousands. So there, you know, some of the words had like 60,000 results, you know, 60,000 people had hashtagged their image with like the word crave. And it's just so fascinating how different they can be. Yeah. Yeah. And so, um, yeah. So I guess my other question too would be kind of like, I could like ask like, what's the craziest thing we've seen looking through a hashtag. But um, my real question would be is kind of, 
like how in what ways I'm really so I'm really interested in kind of how you're kind of sourcing these images and kind of translating them into your own personal practice and so on. Um, what type of tools do you use in the translation from something from Instagram that is then coming into a painting? Yeah, so um, I use technology throughout the process. Um, aside from sourcing from Instagram, I'm also working back and forth in Photoshop. So I, I don't necessarily know exactly how my final image is gonna look in the beginning, um, but oftentimes in my work, the beginning layers are kind of um, spontaneous and so, I'll prepare a panel because um, they're on wood panels and I'll put a base of like gesso and maybe some absorbent ground and I'll throw down some layers of paint and just let it seep and react, you know, with the panel. And then from that, um, a, a palette, a color palette emerges and that helps me decide like which images to pull. So all the images, let's say I have like a warm, you know, kind of orange, um, magenta kind of palette going then I'll I'll see which images may you know work well and tie into that palette and then I start placing the images down oftentimes I'll take like a photograph early on and then I'll upload that and put that in Photoshop and start playing adding layers in Photoshop so and then you know and then I'll paint those layers and then it just keeps going like that this back and forth so painting uploading, seeing the image, kind of planning out the next layers with Photoshop, and then painting again, collaging, and so on. And, and so I can build up, you know, many layers like that. Nice. Do you have any examples you can show us? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, so I'll pull a couple down. This is um, a smaller piece. Um, it's one of my favorites here. So. Um, Hopefully you can get from the video some of the three-dimensionality. I'm going to like turn it to the side a little bit. I don't know. Oh, so how are you treating the surface? Yeah, so, so there are um, layers of paint and collage, and between each layer of paint and collage is a clear layer of um, poured medium, like acrylic medium. Oh, okay. So, yeah, so they look a little bit like glass. Um, they're really clear and... Um, you know, I, I've anywhere from like, worked anywhere from maybe four and six source images up to about 12. <laughs> the, the, the higher limit was just based on like the time. Um, they're super, super labor intensive pieces. Yeah. Um, just because of the layering and, and kind of the planning that goes into them. Yeah. Nice, and um, it's really nice to kind of, I like how you're handling the pattern in those pieces too. Yeah, yeah, and so they're, pretty symmetrical not not entirely sometimes but they're pretty symmetrical and you know a traditional mandala um usually has repetition of like circles and squares so you know i kept with that idea but then you know the motifs the images are all modern yeah and so yeah. kind of like like merging these two things together in a very interesting experimental way it's awesome to see and even the way that you're handling like the layering and then the layers between those layers kind of make it so it's more like a physical object that's hanging on the wall. It's yeah, awesome. it is. The more they're layered, the more three-dimensional. And I think the more they um, ask you or entice, to, entice you to look at them closely, you know, and kind of figure out what's going on and, and recognize that they're like Instagram images. And then, you know, hopefully they get people just, you know, curious and thinking about, you know, what could this be about? So. so then um, when you're displaying the pieces, is that information given to the viewer? So kind of like, do you tell them what, I, what you were hashtagging? Yeah, um, I have that summarized in an, often in an artist statement that goes along with the pieces um, that's hung with the show. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. That's really cool. So um, what type of stuff do you plan on including in ArtFest? Um, so I have these pieces. I have some smaller ones. And I have some bigger ones. So the smallest of my series is like eight by eight. And then um, I have 16 by 16. And then I have some 24 by 24s. So that's as big as they get. Just um, the medium was kind of a limiting factor that pouring medium and, and it's setting and all of that. Um, but I also have some older pieces, which I'd like to show you that are pieces on, on paper that I actually framed. Um, these are from around 2016. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, there's a little bit of a glare. I can see, I yeah. can see, yeah, kind of what you're seeing. Um, 
But these are loosely based on a Chinese folk tale about a fish that swims up a river and um, jumps a waterfall and gets turned into a dragon. So um, these are all from a series um, that I made called The Legend of the Koi. And I have one, two, three, about six or seven of these of various sizes, anywhere from like 14 by 14 to about 32 by 32. Awesome. And so then um, is that a painting and collage piece? Yeah, yeah. So like the mandalas, um, the legend of the koi pieces, they are done in fluid acrylics. And there are also pieces of um, paper collaged in. Um, but these are done on paper. These are done on paper. Cool. And um, it's also really cool. It's interesting to see how your development of the image has kind of progressed from mm -hmm. your older work to the work you're doing now. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Um, even though they have kind of different themes and origins, um, you know, some people say like the style they see, the way like kind of the artist signature is, is present. Um, uh, and I mean, for me, I would say that's like, I'm really interested in colors and patterns um, and often like repeating shapes and, um, and there's often movement in my work. Yeah. So um, you said you were an educator earlier. I'm also an yeah. educator myself. Oh, cool. Yeah. Cool. And yeah. So, are you still teaching at all? I am. I'm teaching. So I was um, full time for many years and that, um, that didn't leave me a lot of time to make art, <laughs> yeah. especially like I worked in public schools for the first four years and then I moved over to private schools and it was still full time. And, and really even then, um, you know, it just teaching is all, all consuming. <laughs> so um, yeah, I went, I went part time in the last couple of years. And, and that's why, like I said, like starting around 2014, 15 is when I, I started making more getting back into my practice. Nice, and so um, Because uh, I guess my other question would be, I can see how you're kind of bringing in different components of like your everyday life into your, into your actual like creative practice. And so um, my other question would be then is kind of, do you see your creative pra practice kind of branching out into other aspects of things you work on? Huh, that's interesting. It could be a really complicated question. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think like one of the things that you maybe learn as an artist is not to get too stuck on like a final result. And you learn through doing that, like sometimes the best things come just through accidents and stuff. So I, if, it's, if it's something, it's more like a theory or just an idea that like not to be too hung up on anything, you know, turning out the way you intended and, and just kind of like to enjoy the process, be that art or be that anything else you might do, you know, just be like present and enjoy it. So. Especially when we're kind of talking about like using art to work through things, right? Yeah, yeah. The process of working through something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's been really like so critical and so wonderful to be able to like take what's going on around me and then bring it into my art. Yeah. But the same thing happens, you know, you know, the ideas that come in the studio sometimes go, you know, I take them into other things that I do. So, yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Is there anything else you'd like for us to know about you before, or for anybody who's going to your site? Um, I don't know, just that the pieces are, you know, the pieces, um, I'm hoping that my images can really show the, the, the layering, especially in the mandala series. But um, you know, it'd almost be great if like, I could have a video or something to show that. But definitely this, you know, if, if people come visit this, then I think it's helpful to understand. Um, yeah. Yes, yeah, so we're, we're, we're excited. Work. We're Sorry? actually doing your work. Thank you, thank you. Awesome. So, um. Sylvie, thank you so much for joining us. And thank you all for taking the time to watch the artist interviews for MPA Art Fest this year. And so um, you can check out all the artists' work on their websites on the mpaartfest.org website. And go ahead and click and start purchasing things or just get in contact with them and get to know more about their work. And so um, thank you all again, and I hope you have a good night.